Hey guys, this is Anthony Morganti from AnthonyMorganti.com. This is episode three of the video series where I critique and process your image. And in this video, I'm doing this great image from Lawrence. Now, the first two episodes I did landscape shots, so I thought I'd mix it up a little bit and do something a little different. Uh, most of the images I have been getting in, though, have been landscape shots. So this series probably will be dominated by me processing landscape images. And one thing I just want to say real quick is in the couple days that since I've started this, I've received probably between 70 and 80 images already. And this is only my third video. So again, I want to reiterate that I will not be getting to everyone's image. And I know a lot of you will be disappointed. I just want to apologize in advance. I'm really sorry, but I won't be able to do everyone's image. But I'm going to do the best job on each image that I do do that I can. Okay. This image here from Lawrence, I think it's a really cool image. It, it, it's going to offer us a lot of artistic options, and I want to talk about these things. Now, as far as the settings and the angle and everything, he's pretty much straight on. He used um, a full-frame Nikon D750 for this shot with a 50-millimeter lens. Now, if 50 millimeters on a full-frame camera is the actual angle of view that we see in, if, we have, if you have normal peripheral vision, that's our angle of view as a human. That's what we see in. So 50 millimeters on a full frame, if you were standing at this point behind this man, this is the way you would see the scene with your own eyes. Now, he's at f4, which is fine because it's an f1.4 lens. And remember in the last video I mentioned you'd like to be two to four stops up from wide open to get the, the most... Um, uh, you know, uh, every pixel to be as crisp and clear as possible so you're not uh, getting any uh, aberration or anything uh, with the lens that's the best point to shoot at. And a 1.4 lens, one stop is f2, two stops is 2.8, three stops is f4, four stops is f5.6. So he's around, you know, between 4 and 5.6 is great. So he's at f4, that's fine. Now, it's a little crooked, but there's a lot of cool lines here. And there's different ways you could go with this. Um, first, actually, I should talk about the lens a little bit more. The 50 millimeter lens, as I mentioned, it's what we see. And the angle of view is also giving us a lot in the background. So we're getting beyond the other side of this building. We're getting this side wall over here and way over here. And then we're getting another building over here. If, no, I don't know if it was possible. If, let's say, he put on a 200 millimeter lens and, and stepped back so that the man is about the same size in the frame as he is in this 50 millimeter shot what would happen is because the angle of view of the 200 millimeter lens is more narrow he wouldn't have got the side building in he wouldn't have got over here in. it would have compressed the background this back part would have appeared to have been closer than it actually is and that's called compression so that's a lot of like um that's a good artistic decision you could make as a photographer how you want to frame the shot but what focal length do you want to do and how does that focal length affect the background or what's behind what you're actually shooting so conversely he could use a 28 millimeter lens and got closer to the guy kept him the same size in the frame but everything in the background would have been further away and it would have had a wider angle of view and got more on the sides so something to keep in mind in different artistic decisions you can make when you're actually pushing the shutter of your camera. Now, with that said, um, personally, as I look at this, I don't care for the building over here and I don't care for the building over there. So I would have preferred probably if, if um, Lawrence used a longer lens and if he was able to step back. I don't know. He could have had a railing behind him and stairways behind him for all I know and he could have you know, not been able to move back at all. But Let's see what we could do with cropping. Now, as far as processing the image, first thing we're going to do is we're going to do lens corrections. This is the way I normally do it. And um, do that first. Then I will usually straighten the image. So I'm going to go and just click Auto and see. Yeah, that straightened it nicely. All right, now, how do we want to do this? Now, there's a lot of lines here and a lot of symmetry. We have these lines of the frame in front of us but we also have that window behind us or behind in front of him like you know way out there and we could do a lot of things with symmetry if you um, are familiar with the photographer Jay Mizell he's one of my favorite photographers and he's really into symmetry he likes to take images that have very symmetrical lines 
uh, leading lines that are parallel or leading lines that recede into each other and they're just perfectly framed where everything is really balanced and that is very satisfying to look at when someone is looking at that type of image it's really satisfying to the viewer and there's a lot to be said about symmetry in photography with that said if you ever studied creative writing you've probably heard for a novelist the best novelists have tension on every page now the opposite of that symmetry in 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 photography at least is when you add a bit of tension and that is you have things pretty much symmetrical but one thing is off and that's called visual weight off and you'll have one thing just a little different now imagine let's say we had a hundred oranges you had a row of ten by a row of ten and they were just laid out in front of you and you had this uh, 100 oranges, 10 by 10. Well, that's symmetrical. You could line it up so it's nice and symmetrical, and that's okay. But let's say you take one orange out, and you put a red tomato in there. So you have these lines of oranges, and then you have one red tomato in there. Well, now you're adding tension, and that's visual weight. Now, I throw out all these terms like this, you know, visual tension, visual weight, things like that. I trust that if you're really interested in this, You'll Google it and look it up later, visual weight in photography. And that is really cool, something that really adds tension to your shot. And when you add tension to the shot, it really makes the viewer interested in the shot. And that's our whole goal here. Have someone look at this and, wow, that's really a nice shot. And, and they maybe can't even explain why it's a nice shot. It's just visually appealing and intriguing to them. So we have these lines, these frame lines. We could go like full symmetrical, but he is offset a little bit he's not right in the middle obviously he wouldn't be right in the middle like right in the middle of this this frame he's off to the side so we could do that we can make everything as symmetrical as possible but he's offset just a little bit and that will be the tension that we add to the shot now how are we going to crop it well i could pull it from the sides and try to do a horizontal crop but i don't think there's enough just eyeballing it there's not enough room above his head and below his feet to really make it so it's perfectly symmetrical with these frame lines in there. It would be more of a square image. And I, I personally don't like to crop outside of the two to three dimension ratio. I sell uh, prints in that ratio, meaning um, I don't sell eight by tens, like I'd sell like an eight by 12. So it has the two to three ratio. I keep that. I And as I mentioned before, I don't crop much. I try to shoot uh, the scene the way it's going to be framed on the wall you know so so I don't crop and I keep that two to three ratio so in this case here I don't want to crop it square uh, square would work though all right I just want to make that it probably would work but what I will do I think is crop it vertically so and I think vertically would look even better so what you would do is you have the crop tool open hit the X key on your keyboard and you'll get a vertical crop and then what what I want to do is I want this frame this vertical frame right here I want that right in the middle right there now he is off to the side and he is just about on this uh, rule of thirds line with the rule of intersection or the intersection point right around his ear now it would be probably more optimum if it was right in the middle of his head but I think this is okay I think that looks pretty cool and we're going to close the crop tool and there's our crop so I think that looks pretty good we accomplished two things cropping it this way. We did this symmetry that I called, and we have a little bit of tension because he's offset. Also, we narrowed the field of view so we're, we don't have that distracting building on the side and these other windows that were over here on the right. Those are no longer in the frame. So we have it a little bit cleaner. All right, so and this is more appealing to me. Now, I'm not 100% sure if I want it color or black and white. And what I usually do is I start out processing it in color, and then I do something uh, which I'll show you what we're going to do with this image. So now to process it, what I'll do is I'll take highlights down because it is very bright. Now, do we want a silhouette or do we want some detail in the man? So, well, let's just see. If we turn open up shadows, I can tell right away I don't care for it. Um, if he had like a you know a really expensive fully pressed suit on with dress shoes i think then you'd maybe want to show some detail in his clothing but you know he's got jeans on i mean not saying he's dressed poorly but i don't think i want that to show i'd prefer that to be a silhouette now what you might want to be careful of is clipping if you start clipping the blacks or clipping the whites and 
You could go up in the histogram and turn on these clipping indicators, these little triangles, by clicking on them. What I prefer to do is hit the J key on the keyboard. When you hit the J key once, you'll turn them on. And if you go too far on shadows, let's say, you'll get this blue in there. And that means you're clipping the black. So typically, you don't always want to clip. So, and well, personally, I don't mind clipping blacks a little, but and I'll talk about that more in a minute. But I, and I mentioned that in previous videos. But I'm going to pull that off because we didn't do a white or blacks adjustment yet either. So that is going to involve that. Now, if you start clipping whites, you'll get red like that. So keep that in mind, uh, the clipping indicators. And that's usually um, something to just, you know, if, if you printed this and you had a lot clipping black, you just have this ton of black ink on your image and it usually on your paper and it doesn't look as well. If you're clipping a lot white, you're not going to have any ink on the paper and it usually doesn't look as good. Now, again, I'm not sure if I'm going to go full color here or black and white, so I'm going to still process it as though it's color. I'm going to turn vibrance up to 10 or so and saturation up to six or so. There's nothing outrageously colorful in here except for whatever this is down here. It looks like a bench or something. So right around there is good. Um, I'm going to go to the tone curve and try medium contrast and then try strong contrast. I'm going to go with medium because I probably will send this over to On One Photo 10 and use dynamic contrast there. And I don't want it to be too contrasty in Lightroom when, before I send it over there. Now I'm going to double click on whites while holding in the shift key to get a quick white point. And it went to plus 14. I'm going to hold the shift key in and similarly double click on blacks to get the black point. Now we'll see if we're clipping anything when I do this. And we just very slightly were clipping down here in his pants. And I don't mind that at all. All right, Just a little clipping. Uh, I mentioned in previous videos my perf my personal preference is I like to clip black just a slight, uh, just a little bit. And whites I don't like to clip at all. So I'm good. I'm going to turn off the clipping indicators by hitting the J key again. All right. So I'm done with the basic panel. Um, I did the tone curve. I'm not going to do anything with HSL. There's nothing in here that's really uh, overly colorful that I feel a need that I have to enhance at all. Um, detail, as I typically do, I will bring sharpening all the way down. Um, it's a full frame camera at ISO 1000. The noise actually isn't bad at all. Uh, but I will just try to do a little noise reduction and see if this helps. It's hard to see actually what is noise and what is dirt on the window, to tell you the honest got truth. I'd say that's good enough right there. All right. So that's that. We did lens corrections already. Um, that's it. Now, again, I wasn't sure. Do I want this color? Do I want this black and white? How do I want to do this? What I usually do is I'll bring it to this point right before I'm going to send it over into any plugin I might use. Then I'll go over on the uh, postage stamp image that's in the film strip and right click. And I'll go up to create virtual copy. And what that does is it just creates what it is, a virtual copy. It's not making another copy on your hard drive. It's just Lightroom is going to interpret this image two different ways in processing. So we have the original, and then we have our virtual copy. And you can tell it's virtual copy by this corner being folded up. All right, so then what we're going to do is go to the HSL panel and make it black and white. And I kind of like that too. So I like it both ways. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go to the color one first. And I'm going to right click on it. And I'm going to go down to edit in. I'm going to go to on one effects 10. And we're going to create a copy with Lightroom adjustments. And we're going to click edit. And that's going to send it over to on one like we did in those previous videos. And I don't think I'm going to do a ton over there in on one. This is a little bit more minimalist. We're going to do a smart photo. So, and I don't really want to spoil that, I guess, um, but I will do that dynamic contrast, which I typically do. You can see it really sharpens it up a lot. And that's why I don't like adding the sharpening in Lightroom because it will tend to get over sharpened if I plan on using this. And I actually, I really truly believe that people just overdo sharpening uh, usually. So, um, you know, it's sharp enough. So that's dynamic contrast. Uh, maybe I want to try this sunshine filter. See how it just added a bit of, like, I don't know, just a different different type of light to the image. Now, I didn't in Lightroom mess around with any of the white balance, which I could have. 
and I didn't even mention that, so I apologize for that. But I usually won't. I think it's kind of good the way it is. Um, but the sunshine, I kind of like that. All right, so did make it a little bit brighter, which I kind of don't like. I just like it that it's a little bit warmer. but not so much brighter. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a tone enhancer and that makes it a little bit darker. So I kind of like that now. Now I got to be careful here. I don't want the background to be so detailed that it's taking the attention away from him. But then again, maybe you do. You want the background detailed in him in silhouette and you're getting some more tension there. It's people are being drawn to that background, but boy, what is that guy looking at over there? You know, so it gets a little tension also. This might be one of those situations where you could process it this way, step away from the image for a day or two, come back and look at it and see what it does for you then. You might decide you don't like it. Now I'm going to leave it. Uh, I kind of like it. Now we're going to try a vignette. I'm not sure a vignette will work well on this image, at least a, a stronger vignette. Actually, I kind of like that too. Now, we do have a reflection of a guy that's cut off over here. That's a little bit distracting, and um, that actually would be kind of hard to remove even in Photoshop. So I actually am going to have to just live with that. Uh, but if I could, I would remove that in Photoshop. But I don't think it would be very easily done. So I'm going to let that go. I like that strong vignette just like that. And I think I'm done with this image, this color image. So we're going to click Apply, and then... We're going to get back into Lightroom, and there's the image. Now we do have, remember, our black and white image, which is right there. So let's send that over to On One Photo 10. So we're going to go to Edit In, On One Effects 10, and we're going to do a copy with Lightroom Adjustments. Now, to save a little time, when you do things like this, On One remembers your previous uh, steps that you did on an image that you, you know, I think like a number of images that you've done before. So what you want to do is you want to go down to here to recently used on the, on the presets on the far left. And these are our recently used things. And the last one, recently used one, is what I just did to that color image. So we click on that and it will bring back all those filters exactly like I did. Now, sunshine filter obviously isn't going to do anything on this color image. So we're just going to get rid of that. Um, the tone enhancer, that's okay. That's okay. And uh, the vignette, I, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know about that. But anyway, let's move the tone. You can move these around too. Um, I want the tone enhancer above the vignette. You can see that adds a little bit different. Um, I think I, I don't know. I think I kind of like it without the tone enhancer, just like that. Now there is a black and white filter I could add to this too. Uh, I already sent it in as black and white. I could have sent it in as color and did the black and white filter itself. And then with the black and white filter, you have all different controls and it actually gets kind of confusing here, the different things you could do uh, to it. But none of these will do much because it's already black and white. So we're just going to get rid of that. I think I'm going to live with it this way. And I think just kind of eyeballing it the way it was, I think I preferred the color version of this image a little better, which is right there, compared to that version. But, you know, it, it could be six of one, half a dozen of the other. Some people like... Uh... Now, you know, too, it seems like uh, a lot of the yellows in this are a little bit maybe overbearing. So what you could do is just even though you finished it in on one, you still could come over here and go like to the HSL panel, go to saturation, and you could pull yellows down a little bit if you think they're just a little too strong, a little bit too distracting from him. So you could bring the saturation of yellow down. And I think that helped a little bit too. So there's a black and white version. There is the color version. This, I'm going to reset it. This was what we started with. All right. So that's how I chose to do it. 
Let me know your thoughts. What do you guys think? You like the black and white one better, the color one better, or you don't like either? Uh, just leave your uh, leave whatever you think down below. And I hope I, that passed on something you might not have known or will um, encourage you to look up some things like visual weight, J, J Mizell, uh, symmetry in photography, tension in photography, things like that. All right, that's it for episode three. Thank you, everyone that watches my videos. I truly do appreciate it. I'll talk to you guys soon.